What makes a good bird? Well, birds are meant to be pretty good at flying, right? So the best bird should be the best flyer. And who's the best flyer? I think many people would say the albatross. They're very fast. They can fly for massive distances all around the world without coming back to land and they exert very little energy doing it. In fact, they're so good that Wikipedia has dubbed them the most legendary bird. But it's not a question of whether or not they're a good flyer. For me, it's a question of how they got so good and why. So that's what we're getting to the bottom of today. How did they become the most legendary bird? Recently I had the privilege of going out with a bunch of fellow Wellingtonian bird nerds to go and look for albatross just outside of Wellington Harbour in the Cook Strait and it was just so awesome to see these birds in their element. They truly are masters of flight, they make it look so easy and I think that that's why they have that legendary status. In fact they're so good at flying that most of my shots turned out looking like garbage because they just speed right through them and I couldn't get any focus on them. Just look at this, such speed, such precision. Such accuracy. I think we'd better get to the bottom of this right now. Let's get on the boat. Also, if you're new here, the albatross would like to say thanks for coming to my channel. Welcome. And if you're new, uh, please consider subscribing. Thank you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're on the boat. In case you didn't realize, um, we're actually on the boat right now. I am your, uh, your, your captain. Actually, no, I'm just a passenger. Who am I kidding? Back to the albatross. What are albatross exactly? Albatross, along with shearwaters, prions, and certain petrels, are procellariforms or tube noses. Procellari, procellari, procellariforms. Let's just stick to tube noses. Tube nose refers to the tube-shaped nostril that all these birds have on their beaks. Some have one, some have two. Tube noses have what's known as a cosmopolitan distribution. God, that's a good word, meaning they're found worldwide, with the exception of the North Atlantic. Now this is crazy. Tube noses spend all their life at sea. They're so well adapted to it that they can drink salt water and rest by floating on the waves. The only time they need to use land is for, yep, having chicks. But I'm sure if they could figure out how to float a nest they would because let's face it, land is not their element. They're pretty adorable and gawky on land. Now tube nose is a really good clue as to why albatross became such good flyers, but what, what the heck would a sense of smell have to do with being a good flyer? Well it all comes down to what niche these birds are in. They are all scavengers. They look for things that have died in the sea and come floating up to the surface. Fish, squid, octopus. That's why they love following fishing boats and probably why they have such a long history with humans and that's potentially why they got such a legendary status as well. Now imagine for a minute you're a tube nose and you're looking for one little squid in the whole ocean. It's a big area to cover. So how have the albatross and the other tube noses uh, gotten around this problem. So the first thing is they have a very good sense of smell. Their beaks are specially designed to pick up on smells that are far away. The, that tube that they have on their beak, those are like little funnels and if you can imagine scent compounds wafting out from the dead thing on the ocean, getting blown around in the wind, that nostril is going to be really good at funneling that smell towards the albatross and then it will be able to respond and go and find the food. There was one study that was done on the wandering albatross by Navet and their colleagues and they found that they can actually smell things from 20 kilometers away. Now you'd think that a rotting piece of seafood would be really really smelly and probably pretty easy to find. But actually what happens out in the ocean is that the scent gets chopped up by all the air turbulence, all of the wind, all of the waves and so it ends up being in all these patches. So even though you might have the right equipment with your beak to be able to pick up on those smells, how are you going to fly into the right places to be able to go past that, those patches of smell? Well that's where part two comes in, their flight pattern. Okay, so to explain this part I'm going to take you back to a very chaotic time. I'm sorry if this is traumatic to you. Who remembers lolly scrambles? If that's a New Zealand only thing I apologise, basically a lolly scramble is there's a crowd of children with an adult standing in the middle tossing lollies into the air from a basket. As you can imagine, pure chaos. There's lollies scattered everywhere. 
And we can imagine these lollies like the scent patches out in the ocean coming from a dead squid or a dead fish. The goal of the lolly scramble is to get as many lollies as you can. Same with the albatross, they want to pick up on as many patches of smell as they can so that they can hone in on their food. So there's lollies scattered everywhere. What do you do? Do you go on a straight line? Pick up maybe three or four lollies that are on your direct path? Or do you zigzag? Go past as many lollies as possible. Maybe you get 10, maybe you get 12, maybe you get Macintosh, maybe you get milk bottle, maybe you luck out and you get like a piece of Hubba Bubba or something like that. That's the technique that I would use. And that's the technique that albatross use too. So their flight pattern is kind of like a zigzag. They go crosswind, so the wind is blowing the smell towards them. Those scent patches are scattered around different parts and so they're zigzagging in and out to be able to hone in on where those smells are strongest. In saying that, Nivette's study did actually find that albatross did quite often fly in a straight line towards their food as well, so I suppose it just depends on how broken up uh, the patches of smell actually are. The other good thing about that is that flying crosswind is the most energy efficient way for these birds to travel. It takes very, very little energy from them at all to be able to fly this way, and that's because their wings are specially adapted. They can hold them out totally straight like that and they have tendons in their shoulders which lock into place and then all they need to do is glide. That doesn't take very much energy. Flying is energy expensive because of all the flapping but this, nah. And just cruising like that they can actually reach speeds of over 120 kilometers per hour and travel massive massive distances. To me that signals a bird that's a very good flyer. If you have to fly without using any energy at all you've mastered it. Even though the food supply is pretty sparse for these birds out in the ocean, they've actually solved the problem by making it so that it doesn't take them much energy at all to be able to find the food, so it kind of balances out. So how do you become the most legendary bird? You get yourself an ocean scavenger niche, you get yourself a beak with some tube shaped nostrils, and you get yourself some long wings with some shoulders that with lockable tendons, and you're well on your way. Pros, you get to travel the world, cons, you have to eat rotting seafood for the rest of your life. Yeah, I think I'll just stick to my pastas. Hey, well done on reaching the end screen. Can I interest you in some more? We got giant snails, we got seals. What can I get you? Yes, excellent choice.